Mr. Speaker, sir, almost one year ago, I received Her Majesty the Queen's Commission with regard to Sir Hugo Drax. The House will recall I gave news then of Sir Hugo's loyal offer to Her Majesty, seriously considered imperative to the defence of Britain. He would construct a superatomic rocket with an exceptional range, the immediate answer to any attempt to atom bomb London. Ten million pounds from his own pocket. The House will recollect that Her Majesty was graciously pleased to accept the bequest and conferred a knighthood on the donor. And now, Mr. Speaker, I must declare to the House that the Moonraker is ready. I shall give further details on Thursday. And when you consider what Sir Hugo is doing for his country, it's really extraordinary that they don't insist on making him Prime Minister. <laughs> Moonraker by Ian Fleming Dramatised by Archie Scotney Starring Toby Stevens as James Bond Bond? James Bond? Samuel West as Sir Hugo Drax Tell you what, Bond, this game needs livening up Catherine Kingsley as Gala Brand What the hell are you doing in my office? Jared Harris as Ronnie Valance I don't like mysteries Patricia Hodge as Professor Train. Bullseye. You're not just a pretty face. And John Standing as M. You heard about Churchill's announcement this afternoon. With Janie D, Julian Sands, Ian Ogilvy, and Nigel Anthony. Martin Jarvis is the voice of Ian Fleming. It was quiet, too quiet. James Bond paused and listened. He felt oddly excited. Cautiously, almost fearfully, he moved forward and pushed through. James! Oh, what a gorgeous suntan. How are you, Money Penny? Thanks. It's hot near the equator. I trust you enjoyed your recuperation. You'd better hope the colour won't last too long. Why's that? Well, you know M. He's always suspicious of sunburned men in England. Thinks they've not got a job of work to do. So, what does he want? I'm not actually sure. Says it's a personal matter. Huh? Something about you might give him a hand? To do what? <laughs> I don't know. Q's in there with him, setting up a film projector, all very mysterious. You'd better go in, James. Had a good leave, 007? Very relaxing, sir. Thank you. Hello, Q. What's this? Going to show some Charlie Chaplin films? Afraid not, 007. Sorry, Emma. 007, would you mind... Could you hold the film about four feet from the end for me? Thanks. And press down on the sprocket shoe. The what? Oh, uh, this. Uh, good. Keep holding. Then I can thread it. Like so. Yeah. Want me to close this? Mm, oh, yes. Can you insert the end in the take-up reel? Oh, you're good at this, 007. Come on, Q. We haven't got all day. Nearly there. Done. Warming up nicely. Already in? I should hope so. You wanted to see me, sir? I did. Sit down. You're aware of this man, Sir Hugo Drax? Who isn't? Sunday Express is running his life story. I'm loving it, actually. Mm. You heard about Churchill's announcement this afternoon. Fascinating story. Well, I'd like to know if your version of the man tallies with mine, or with British Movie Tone News. They've lent us this clip. Let's have a look, Q. Uh, certainly, M. Um, rolling. This is Movie Tone. Leslie Mitchell reporting. Ha, Leslie, good man. We take off first to a secret location where Britain is privileged to say thank you to Sir Hugo Drax. How's it going, Sir Hugo? Not long to go now. Patriotic Sir Hugo is seen here with his team, putting the finishing touches to the Moonraker's exciting test launch. Any message for the nation, Sir Hugo? I send my humble thanks to Her Majesty. We'll be clearing shipping lanes and airspace for Moonraker to uh, fire away and land safely somewhere in the North Sea. And our thanks to Sir Hugo from a grateful Britain. 
Remind us of your special message to the Queen last year, Sir Hugo. Oh, may I have the temerity, Your Majesty? Something like that. <laughs> temerity. A big word from a big heart. And may Britain send you a huge hug and an even bigger thank you for keeping these islands safe and secure. God bless Moonraker and Sir Hugo Drax, Great Britain's champion. Well, that's all, folks. Sorry. What do you think, 007? Sort of Superman, really. His friends call him Hugger Drax. <laughs> I'm quite a fan. Q, what do you have from the war office? Quite a bit, actually, Em. Blown up by the Germans in '44 between the American and British armies. Hospitalised for some months, finally discharged with a full disability pension. Originally from somewhere up north, I believe. An orphan. What's this all about, sir? I'll come clean, 007. Drax is a member of my club, Blades. I played bridge with him, talked to him at dinner. If I could take over here, Em. The metal market heard of him soon after the war. Seems he cornered a valuable ore called Columbite. Jet engines can't be made without it. Byproduct of the Nigerian tin mines. He initially operated from Tangier. Drives a Type 300 S Merc. <laughs> well, he deserves it. Sorry, carry on. 007? First million within a year. The public loved it. If a wounded British soldier could do it, why shouldn't anybody? And then years later, his loyal letter to the Queen. Which makes it very odd. Why, sir? Sir Hugo Drax cheats at cards. Cheats? That's what I said. But why does Drax do it? And so well that nobody's caught him yet. Always bridge. I doubt if anyone has begun to suspect him, except Lord Basildon, chairman of Blades. He came to me. Wants to save Drax from making a fool of himself. Anyway, I've agreed to help. That's where you come in, James. You're the best card player in the service. Or you should be after all those casino jobs you've been on. We spent quite a lot of money putting you through that card sharping course before the war. Waxing the aces. Shiners. Mirrors built into rings. <laughs> it's strange. I mean, Drax is not a particularly good player, but he hasn't lost since he joined Blades a year ago. It's getting talked about in a joking sort of way. What a system, do you think? Who knows? Does he often play with the same man? Well, nearly always brings a chap called Meyer, his metal broker. Not a bad player. I might be able to spot something. How about coming along tonight? I wouldn't like to see him get into a mess. Well, nobody wants a scandal. And I don't want anything going wrong with this moonraker of his. Well, thanks. Better cut along now and sandpaper your fingertips or whatever you sharpers do. Finish with the projector, Em? Yes, Unless you've got the cruel sea. That evening, Bond left the Bentley outside Brooks's and walked round the corner into Park Street. The Adam frontage of Blades was elegant in the soft dusk. He pushed through the swing doors and walked up to the old-fashioned Porter's Lodge, ruled over by Brevet, the guardian of Blades, and the counsellor and family friend of half the members. Good evening, Mr Bond, sir. Nice to see you again. The Admiral's waiting for you in the card room. Page, take Commander Bond up to the Admiral. Lively now. This way, sir. As Bond followed the uniformed page boy up the wide staircase, he remembered the story of how at one election nine black balls had been found in the box when there were only eight members of the committee present. Brevet was said later to have confessed that he was so afraid the candidate would be elected that he had put in a black ball himself. No one had objected. The committee would rather have lost its chairman than the porter whose family had held the same post at Blades for a hundred years. Minutes later, M, with Bond beside him, wandered casually from table to table, exchanging greetings with the players until they reached the last table. They stood by the wide Adam fireplace, watching. <laughs> Sorry, Lord Basildon. Didn't expect my partner to have a Yarborough, did you? I did not. Well, that's just uh, 400 above the line. The more I play, the luckier I get. Thanks, mm. partner. Oh, uh, thanks to you, Hugger. Yes, but Max, can't you pick up a few aces? I'm tired of doing all the work. <sighs> ah, spies on the starboard bow. What are you making of it, gentlemen? Come forward, don't be shy. Good evening, Sir Hugo. Impressive. <laughs> Hard luck, Chairman. You remember my friend Commander Bond, Baz? Evening, Commander. Uh, this is Max Meyer, Tommy Dangerfield, Hugo Drax. Hello there. You all know the Admiral? 
Glad to have you aboard, Admiral. Splice the main brace? No, thanks. I've just had one. What about you? What's your name again? Uh, nothing for me, thanks. Oh. Long rubber, Admiral. Sorry to have kept you out so long. How about a challenge after dinner? Max and I'll take on you and Commander Thingamy. What's his name again? Bond. James Bond. What do you say, James? Fine. Sir, how about showing me the betting book before dinner? You always say it'll amuse me. Indeed. Come along. It's in the secretary's office. Then, Baz, you can come and give us a cocktail and tell us the result of this death struggle. Uh, order what you want. I'll be down directly we've polished them off. Pipe you aboard about nine, then, James Bond. Judging by these cards, I shall have the casino's money to play with. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Blades. <laughs> What's the verdict? Any luck? He cheats all right. How does he do it? Only on the deal. Meaning? You know the cigarette case he has in front of him, with his lighter? He never takes cigarettes from it, doesn't want to get finger marks on the surface. When he deals, it's almost concealed by the cards and his big hands. Deals four piles quite close to him. Every card is reflected in the top of the case. A mirror? A shiner, exactly. Well, he obviously has a first-class memory. That first double we watched. He knew what his partner had. Rest of the time, he just plays his average game. Though knowing all the cards on every fourth deal is a terrific edge. But one doesn't notice him doing it. Quite natural to look down when you're dealing. Everybody does. And he covers up with all that banter. Basildon's not going to be pleased. Damn the bloody man. I'll have to tell the committee. The man's a public hero. I'm sorry. So what am I to do, Miles? I don't see how you can shirk it, Baz. Yes, but bound to be a leak. And then look at the scandal. They tell me the Moonraker can't exist without Drax. Winston says the country's future depends on the thing. Any alternative, Commander? Well, if you don't mind paying him out in his own coin... Oh, do anything you bloody well like. I could warn him off, flay the hide off him in his own game, so to speak. All right with you, sir? Well, as long as you don't want me to palm any cards or anything of that sort. <laughs> no. All I need is a couple of packs of used cards, one of each colour, and ten minutes in here alone. Oh, and plenty to drink. What? If you don't mind, I'll have to seem a bit three sheets when the time comes. Mmm, oh. Tattinger. By the way, what are we playing for? Well, Drax likes what he calls one and one. Sounds modest enough, and in fact, it's one ten or a hundred mm. and one hundred pounds on the rubber. I see. But he's perfectly happy to play for two and two, even five and five. That's up, then. Sometimes it's more like poker. Look out. Well, gentlemen, are the geese for the plucking? What do you think, Max? Should we go ahead and lay out the axe in the basket? <laughs> Be with you in a moment, gentlemen. You go along and stack the cards. No artificial aids needed, eh, Max? <laughs> I shouldn't think so, Hugger. Don't be long. Made your wills. <laughs> Cheers, Hugger. Steady, James. Any final plans? I'll have to fatten him up. Don't worry if I seem to be betting high. Watch out when it's his deal. Do you mind if I sit on his left? No. Anything else? At the right moment, I'll take a white handkerchief out of my jacket pocket. That'll mean that you're about to be dealt a Yarborough. All cards lower than nine. I know what a Yarbra is, 007. I'm not a beginner. Of course not, sir. But just leave the bidding of that hand to me. Stakes, gentlemen? I believe five and five is your limit, Drax. Let's play for that. Pass over the bottle, will you? Thanks. Right. Bond, is it? Five and five? Yep. I'll deal. Suddenly, Bond didn't care about the high stakes or Moonraker. This was a private affair. All he wanted was to give this bastard the lesson of his life. Well, first rubber to us, James. Mm. Lost £900. Cards seem to be running against us. Shall we go straight on? No point in cutting. No, no objection to you keeping the deal. That's more like it. Hug it. You're wonderful. <laughs> How the devil do you do it? Memory. What do you mean, memory? What's that got to do with anything? I was going to add and card sense, the two qualities that make great card players. Oh, I see. Your deal. Even Stevens. Yeah. Come on, let's <laughs> oh, More champagne, James. Yeah. Second bottle always tastes better. Yeah, I'll drink to that. <laughs> Passion pop, hugger, old chap. No, but I tell you what, Bond, this game needs livening up, even if you don't. What? A hundred we win this hand. What do you say? Well, on your deal, Sir Hugo? Well, uh, don't mind if I do. <laughs> 
And the same on the next hand? All right, if you want to throw good money after bad. Bad luck. Hmm. What did I tell you? Let's see if you can get it back. My condolences. No. Golly, it's hot in here. <laughs> but God is with the big battalions. You've got to have the cards as well as play them. So, had enough? What? Uh, wait a minute. Oh. Yeah. A hundred on the next two hands. Your wish is my command, Commander. <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry, partner. I've lost them both and the bloody rubber. Uh, oh. Save trouble if we just double the stakes on this one. All right with you, Drake? Um, uh, Drax? Taken. Hundred pounds, a hundred and a thousand on the rubber. Mm. But are you sure you're still on? Of course I am. Wait, where are my cards? <laughs> ah, ah. Of course I'm on for it. Made the bet, didn't I? All right, then. <clears throat> Three no trumps here. Oh, law. Oh. oh, that's more like it, big battalions, hugger. Cards are turning, my deepest apologies. Bloody lucky <laughs> run. <laughs> Telling me... I'm afraid this'll have to be my last rubber, Draxy boy. Gotta get up early. Wait. Mm. Bond, I make it you win a couple of hundred or so. Of course, if you want to scamper away, you can. But what about some fireworks to finish up with? Treble the stakes on the last rubber? Fifteen and fifteen? Historic match? Am I on? Bond? Treble, Drax. You're on. I, I say don't include me in on this, Hugger. No, don't worry, Max. This is just a little bet with our rash friend here. Cut the cards, for God's sake. Righty ho. Hello there, gentlemen. Mm. If I'd come and cast an eye over this battlefield. <laughs> and let's see your score sheet, Commander. Oh, seems you're holding the champions. What are the stakes? Fifteen and fifteen on my left. Good heavens. The chap wanted to gamble, I accommodated him. Now he goes and gets all the cards. Across the table, M saw a white handkerchief materialise in Bond's right hand. He seemed to wipe his face with it. Then it was back in his pocket. A blue pack was in Bond's hands, and he was already dealing. Fifteen and fifteen, Drax. I hope nobody's going to get hurt. Your opinion, Bond? Cheers, Baz. Historic. So, Bond, I've got some good tickets here, I'll admit it, but then you might have two, for all I know. Care to have something extra just on this hand? Oh, well, now, let's see. Mmm, not bad. What are you suggesting? But what about a hundred a trick on the side? All right, you're on. You've obviously got a big hand, so frankly, I better chance it. Here we go. Seven clubs. What? A grand slam in clubs? Mm. Well, it's your funeral. What do you say, Max? No bid. Why the hell didn't I just go home? No bid. I'm afraid you've fallen into my hands, Commander. Double. Hang on, hang on. That means you double the side beds, too. Yes, that's what I meant, you tipsy oaf. Uh, steady hey. on, Drax. That's all right, it's all right. Actually, redouble, Drax. 400 a trick on the side. Wait. Go on. Redouble. Basildon walked round the table, scrutinising all the hands. Suddenly, he understood. Drax's aces and kings would be totally valueless. Come on, lead something, Max. You can't be here all night. Sorry. Uh, Knave of diamonds. Apologies, Maya. Chicane in diamonds. Max, you damn fool. Want to hand it to him on a plate? Whose side are you on? Best I could do, hugger. By this time, Drax could see what might happen. He waited fearfully, his cards slippery with sweat. Bond looked straight into Drax's eyes. He slowly drew out the Queen of Diamonds and placed it on the table. Without waiting, he followed it with the eight, seven, six, five, four, and his two winning clubs. It was sheer murder. That's all, Drax. What? Max, let me see your cards. Oh, Bond! Cheat! You're a bloody cheat! That's enough, Drax! I've been watching the whole game. Settle up. Any complaints, put them in writing to the committee. The committee? You... Very well. I owe about £15,000. It's actually nearer to... Shut up, Max. I accept your addition. As for you, Commander, you pathetic elbow bender, I should spend the money quickly. Good night. Good night, gentlemen. Morning, 007. 
You were pretty dreadful. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Trouble down at Drax's headquarters last night. Double killing. Police caught up with him when he got back to the Ritz at half past one this morning. Oh? Two men from the Moonraker got shot near the plant. Drax is down there now. Mm, curious coincidence. But isn't this a police job? Partly. So-called secret location. Not far from Dover, the construction team have all gone. There's only Drax and 13 others left on the site. <laughs> Suit of cards and a joker. Well, 11 of them are Germans. More or less all the guided missile experts the Russians didn't get. <laughs> Drax paid for them to come over. The Ministry appointed their own security officer to live on the site, a Major Talon. And he was... Uh... One of the two who got killed last night, yes. Witnesses? Plenty. It happened in a local public house. After that evening of Drax, it was, as you remarked, a curious coincidence. Very, sir. There's one more thing. This has got to take priority. They're going to fire the Moonraker on Friday. Practice launch. Less than four days' time. And the double killing? Well, I spoke to Ronnie Vallance at Special Branch about that this morning. Uh, the pub is on the edge of the cliffs. Last night, about 7.30, the Ministry security man, this chap Talon, went along there and was chatting away with some of the Germans when the murderer, if you like to call him that, came in and walked straight up to Talon. He pulled out a Luger, said, I love Gala Brand, you shall not have her, in German. Gala? Uh, yes, then he shot Talon through the heart, put the smoking gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Who's Gala? Oh, that's another complication. She's an agent of the special branch. Bilingual in German. One of my best girls. You know me, Em. I planted Gala on Drax, finagled for her to be taken on as his private secretary. She's been there since the beginning. She have anything to report? Absolutely nothing. Says Drax is an excellent chief, much respected, drives his men like hell. Oh, she knew Talon, of course. Oh, nothing like that. Old enough to be her father. Happily married. Four children. And the killer? Dieter Bartsch, electronics expert. She barely knew him. What do his friends say? His roommate says Bartsch was madly in love with Gallibrand and put his whole lack of success down to Talon. He wasn't surprised to hear of the shooting. And? Well, Talon's reports had all been negative. Then he suddenly rang the ministry yesterday afternoon, said he thought something was going on at the site, asked to see the minister personally at ten o'clock this morning. A few hours later, he gets shot. What a palaver, eh, Em? What about this test launch, sir? I'm waiting to hear from the PM. If they stick to the schedule, it'll be noon on Friday, using a dummy warhead and firing her vertically with only three-quarter tanks. Oh. They've cleared about a hundred square miles of the North Sea. Full details from the PM on Thursday. <laughs> Yes, Miss Moneypenny? The Prime Minister again, sir. Oh, right. Stay there, 007. Yes, Winston? Miles, I'm now asking the obvious question. Which is? Evidence of any intention to sabotage the Moonraker. None. Our only fears concern Talon's vague message about something going on and the double murder. Oh, well, we both know it would be a colossal victory for the Russians to sabotage Moonraker on the eve of her practice shoot. Well, if they did it well enough, they might get the whole project shelved. Well, they're not going to. So we proceed. Talon will be replaced at once, and as you advise me, the new man must be bilingual in German, a sabotage expert, and what was the other thing? Plenty of experience of our Russian friends. Good. I'm cutting a lot of red tape very quickly. Jax has been notified of full steam ahead. And over to you and your man. All right, 007, it's you. Uh, what's me? You're the new security officer. See, Hugo expects you down at his headquarters in time for dinner this evening. Oh, charming. I'll go and pack. Well, hold on. I booked you in first for a crash course in guided missiles. Crash? Ministry of Supply. You're to meet Professor Train, runner-up for the Physics Nobel Prize last year. You can go over there now. Right. I look forward to meeting him. Her, actually, 007. Now, listen, old sport. You know nothing about rockets, so I'm not going to fill up your noddle with expansion ratios and Keplerian ellipses. I'm obliged, Professor. Just give that cord a tug, old bean. <clears throat> Jolly good. So let's have a deco at the chart. Oh. Kicking off with the nose, first you've got the warhead. There. For the practice launch, this will contain upper atmosphere instruments, jolly old radar and such like. Then the gyro compasses to make it fly straight, what I like to call pitch and yaw gyro and roll gyro. Mission critical, this. Right. Are, are those the fuel tanks? You bet. 30,000 pounds, the ballet stuff. 
and at the stern, 400 pounds of hydrogen peroxide mixes with 40 pounds of potassium permanganate. Hmm. Quite a cocktail. Chin chin. Getting my drift, shipmate? Same principle as a jet plane. Bullseye. You're not just a pretty face. And then it's like the blue touch paper, like any other firework. Questions? Yes. How can you be certain it'll come down where you mean it to? What's to prevent it falling on the Hague on Friday? The gyros, old cock. They'll see to that. But no chance is taken. We're using an automatic radar homing device on a raft in the middle of the North Sea. Transmitter in the rocket's nose, which picks up an echo from our gadget and bobs your auntie. One more question. Fire away. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you wanted to sabotage the rocket, what would be the easiest way? Oh, <laughs> naughty, naughty. Since you ask, any number of ways. Grit in the pumps, hole on the fuselage. With that power, the teeniest fault would mean... Toodaloo. Spot on, chum. Well, thanks. It seems you've got fewer worries about Moonraker than I have. Look, it's a spiffing machine. She'll fly beautifully if nobody interferes with her. Drax has played a blinder. I gather his team will do anything for him. Oh, sure as hell. Good luck. Big hug to hugger. Rule Britannia. My dear Commander, we meet again. And so soon. Didn't realise you were a ruddy spy for my ministry, or I'd have been more careful about playing against you. <laughs> so we bury the hatchet, do we, Commander? Wherever you like. <laughs> Spend that money yet? Uh, not yet. Haven't seen the colour of it. Of course, settlement on Saturday. Probably get the cheque just in time to celebrate our little firework display, what? Now, let's see. This is my secretary, Miss Brand. Mm. Good evening, Miss Brand. How do you do? Bond. James Bond. Uh-huh. And our resident genius, Dr. Walter. Walter. Good night. Yes, all right, Doctor. Willy, jump to it. Yeah, man, Captain. This is my, what shall I say, my ADC, Willy Krebs. Very pleased to meet you, Commander Boy. All right, Willy. Your excellent dry martinis for us, please. Except, of course, for the Doctor. Yes, sir. Dr. Walter doesn't drink or smoke. Hardly breathes. Thinks of nothing but the rocket, do you, my friend? You are pleased to joke, Hugo. Now, now. Everybody's quite happy about those leading edges, except you. The good doctor is always having nightmares about something, Bond. Now it's the edges of the fins. They're already as sharp as razor blades, Doctor. Hardly any wind resistance. There is a risk they could melt. Well, then the whole rocket will melt, and that's just not going to happen. You don't know. They could melt, and Moonraker kaput. And sure you can see. Martini, a Bond. Yeah. Prost. Hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, you are kind. Sir Hugo is very exacting. Oh, really? Keep his glass filled, Kerbs. And then perhaps our friend would like to wash. We dine at eight sharp. Are you finding it interesting here, Miss Brand? Uh-huh. How do you like being a secretary? How do you like being so inquisitive? Oh. Care for a swim sometime? No. Ah. Forgive my further possible impertinence, but I'm admiring your beautiful ring. I'm dazzled. Who's the brave man? If this is some kind of joke, Mr Bond, I don't find it in the least amusing. Bond felt a strong urge to give her a sharp kick on the ankle. All right, everyone. Moonlight stroll. Time to introduce our new security officer to the Moonraker. Dr Walter, please accompany us. <laughs> and Krebs. Good night, Miss Brown. I hope you have a head for heights here, Bond. Stop a moment, Bond. I'll explain the geography. You go ahead, Doctor. They'll be waiting for you. Don't worry, my dear fellow. The people at High Duty Alloys know what they're doing. I do worry. You don't know. All right, Bond. You see the white dome. Mm. In there is the tip of the Moonraker. What you see is the lid of a wide shaft that has been cut about 40 foot down into the chalk of this cliff. The two halves of the dome are opened hydraulically. If they were open now, you would see the nose of the Moonraker protruding above the level of the wall. 200 yards over there is our firing point, concrete blockhouse full of radar tracking gadgets, screens. So where will you be when the launch takes place? When we fire, there won't be anyone within a mile of here. Except the BBC team who will be in the firing point. I hope it stands up to the blast. Oh, the BBC are indestructible. <laughs> Follow me. 
Entry to the dome forbidden when red lamp shows. Ring and wait. Herbs, press the code. Yes, yeah, sir. The door will open electronically. Go through to the ante room. Leave your jacket here. 70 degrees is quite warm. Bond remembered the Beretta at his armpit. I'm fine. Suit yourself. Forward now to the catwalk. Shade your eyes. It's going to be very bright. <sighs> My God. Hold on to the guardrail. <sighs> when Bond took his hand away, he was greeted by a scene of such splendor that he stood speechless, his eyes dazzled by the terrible beauty of the greatest weapon on Earth. What do you think of her? One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Warhead above. Experimental one for now. The gyro chamber just level with us here. Then mostly fuel tanks all the way down until you get to the turbines near the tail. The steel floor under the rocket slides away. Herr Bond, there is a big exhaust pit underneath. It comes out at the base of the cliff. Uh, you can see it tomorrow. Hope you don't burn down the white cliffs on Friday. You're worse than Dr. Walter. Right, we'll climb down and have a look at the works. You like me better now? I'm admiring your achievement. I'll go first. Don't look down. Okay, look up now, Commander. So incredibly slim and graceful, don't you think? Extraordinary to think what pressure it'll have to withstand. Most powerfully controlled explosion ever attempted. Am I mad? I don't know. <laughs> what about the shock as it plunges back to hit the Earth? The sea. It'll be like committing murder. Murder? My baby, Moonraker. Uh, Sir Hugo, I'm sorry, but the sluts in the exhaust vent. Is the Ministry quite happy about the melting point? Uh, they do not feel, perhaps, Oh, that, uh... please, Doctor. So was have I never so forgotten. Bond, these are some of our technicians. Everyone gather round. This is Commander Bond, our new security officer. He has his own duties to perform. Commander, meet our experts. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right, back to work. We've wasted enough time. See to it, Krebs. Yeah, my Captain. All right, you people. Schnell, bitte. Come along to my office, Bond. I'll show you the flight plan. This way. Come through. Airlock? That's right. Workshops along there, my secretary's room. Here's my office. Come in. And now we can see. Two maps. What's the red dot for? That's where we are now, our site. Uh -huh. And the diamond in the middle of the ocean? That's 80 miles away. Between the Frisian Islands and Hull. Where Moonraker will land. Latitude 50 and up, yes. And these? Compass readings. Ready reckoner for the gyro settings. We get the weather every day from the RAF. And we'll set the gyros just before the takeoff. Hmm. Miss Brand gets together the data every morning and keeps a table of gyro settings in case they're wanted. <laughs> Not sure I follow all that. You don't have to. Leave it to Miss Brand. Now then, questions? Not much for you to do. The place is riddled with security. The Ministry insisted on it from the beginning. Everything looks fine. Was there anything between your secretary and Major Talon? Could have been. Attractive girl. I called in at the pub on my way. I gather from the landlord that Barsh saluted and shouted, Heil Hitler, before he put the gun in his mouth. So they tell me. Well, lights out, I think. You'll be sleeping in the dead man's bed. Ah! What the hell are you doing in my room? Ah! <laughs> Let's begin. <laughs> What are you looking for? I answer no questions except to Sir Hugo. Oh, really? Oh, you have no right to question me. I'm doing my duty. Your duty? Who told you to search my room? Let me down, Oh, that's very nice. Now get out. I'll beat the daylights out of you. Get out! It was a dick! What are you doing in my office? Morning. You might have a spare chair for visitors. Sir Hugo wants you. I was just going to see if you'd got up yet. Liar. You heard me go by at half past seven. I saw you peering out between the curtains. I did nothing of the sort. You heard the car, all right. Oh, come on. I can't spend all morning playing guessing games. He wants both of us and he doesn't like being kept waiting. Just a minute. I need to tell you about my early morning adventure. Later. We have to go in. Ah, surprise, surprise. Thought you might have left us, Commander. Guards reported you out at 7.30 this morning. I had to make a telephone call. Hope I didn't disturb anyone. There's a phone in my study. Talon found it good enough. Poor Talon. 
Well, so long as you don't upset my men. Sit, both. They haven't recovered from Monday yet. I hope you're not wanting to ask them a lot of questions. I believe their files are in Talon's room. Your room. Have you had a look at them yet? No key to the filing cabinet. Sorry, my fault. Should have given them to you last night. Here. The inspector chap on the case asked me to hand them over to you. Thanks. By the way, how much do you trust Krebs? Oh, well spotted, security officer. He's just curious. Likes to play the detective. Really? Well, then. Two more days to go. This is the itinerary. Would you read it out, Miss Brand? Of course. Today, Wednesday, one o'clock, the site will be closed for fueling. Television cameras to record everything. Then if there's an explosion, our successors will know better next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday morning, the site reopened until midday for final check. Yes, and from that moment, except for the gyro settings, the Moonraker will be ready to go. Of course, guards will be permanently on duty round the site. Go on. Uh, Friday morning, Sir Hugo will supervise the gyro settings. Ministry personnel takes over the firing point. Mm -hmm. RAF mans the radar. And BBC will begin their running commentary at 11.45. At midday exactly, Sir Hugo will press the plunger. Plunger? It's just a button, actually. At which moment? Yes, Miss Brand. Ministry of Supply experts will be in a salvage ship. After the rocket has landed, they will try to bring up the remains. Oh, yes, and the Prime Minister has told me there will be a special cabinet meeting to listen to the broadcast. The palace will be listening in too. So, what do you think? Everything taken care of. After lunch, why don't you have a look at the beach and the bottom of the cliff? That's the only weak spot I can think of. I'm not, not really, but if someone wanted to get into the site, maybe he would try the exhaust pit. Take her with you. All right, Miss Brand? Two pairs of eyes? So, what's your routine? What's it to you? <laughs> I'm security officer. In my office, each morning by 8.30, there's always a sheaf of Air Ministry teleprints on my desk. I transfer their contents to a weather map, then I go through into Drax's office, pin the map on his notice board, make calculations and record the results. Huh. I'm impressed. You should be. I'm carrying gyro settings in my head for almost every variation in the weather at the different altitudes. Drax relies on your expertise, then? No, he bloody doesn't. He and that insufferable Dr. Volta work out my figures all over again. Then they transfer the results into a black notebook. He carries it in his hip pocket. How do you know all this? I'm special branch, for God's sake. <laughs> I was almost forgetting. So Drax doesn't trust your figures? Clearly not. It undermines my chance of having some small part in the final launching of the rocket. Such loyalty. Fueling's going to begin. Sorry! Thank you! Danker! Let's get on with our walk. Where's the path down? You mentioned a crack of dawn adventure. Oh, yes. Early this morning, I opened the locked filing cabinet in my room. Uh, Talon's old room. What, no keys necessary? I have my own bag of tricks. Anyway, nothing very interesting, except an admiralty chart of the Straits of Dover, with two faint lines drawn on it to form a cross-bearing in the sea. X marks the spot. Mm. Was Major Talon onto something? Not sure. Where the lines met was the trace of a question mark on a direct bearing from the house to the South Goodwin lightship. And the unknown object? <sighs> Who knows? A boat, a light, a noise? There were night vision glasses by the window. And on Tuesday night, Talon was murdered. Hmm. Ich liebe Gala. Heil Hitler. And your morning trip? To find a safe phone. To call your boss, Ronnie Valance. I've now sent him the mysterious chart via the local police inspector and some pretty fingerprints. He's your greatest fan, by the way. The inspector? No, Ronnie. Beautiful wild flowers along here. Bet you don't know what this is. You know that flowers scream when picked. What? Some professor has written a treatise on it. The reaction to pain. He recorded the scream of a rose being picked. Rubbish. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought you were sentimental. Aren't you MI6 people licensed to kill? Blood on your hands. Flowers can't shoot back. Ah, but this is a wild orchid. <laughs> so I'm a murderer, am I? Mm, give it to me. My hands are dripping already. There. You can stick it in the muzzle of your revolver. 
I'll wear it as a buttonhole in my shirt. I thought a shoulder holster would look a bit conspicuous without a jacket. And I don't think Krebs will be going over my room again. Meaning? I found him in there last night. I administered a kick on his backside. And like Billy Bunter, he ran yerooing away. I've never trusted him. Well, here's the beach. Time for our date at the exhaust pit. Oh, careful! Shingle from here on in. So, Mr. Security, what's your assessment so far? I could ask you the same thing. You first? Not much. A few question marks. Nothing that has a bearing on any sabotage of the Moonraker. Agreed. And that's all we're concerned with. Protection from possible enemies. Look, I've been down here since the beginning and I've seen nothing wrong. Every one of the team, from Sir Hugo down, is heart and soul behind the project. They worship him. And the place is solid with security. I admire him for it. He's a ruthless man with deplorable manners. But I actually like working for him. I'm longing for the Moonraker to be a success. Okay. I get it. Well, there's the exhaust pit exit. 20 feet up the cliff face. God, imagine the blazing shaft of flame come howling out, melted chalk pouring into the sea. Terrifying. What was it? The weak spot? You know we're in range if anything goes wrong with the fueling out there. Let's move further along, then. What are you thinking? Well, I'm imagining myself with, say, six tough men and all the right gear. How would we set about attacking the site from the sea? Hmm. Kayaks to the jetty at low tide, a ladder to the lip of the exhaust tunnel... But then what? Impossible to climb the steel walls. Fire an anti-tank weapon through the floor beneath the rocket, hope something would catch fire. And getting away afterwards? Would be nasty. <laughs> Sitting targets from the top of the cliff. But that wouldn't worry a Russian suicide squad. True. So Hugo has guards along the top at night, and searchlights. Orders to shoot and ask questions afterwards. What if the opposition had covering fire from a midget submarine? I'm going for a swim. The chart says there's a 12-fathom channel out there. I'll be happier when I've seen for myself. Gauge the depth available to an enemy. Fancy a bathe? <laughs> After stewing inside that concrete dome all morning? Well, I... What are we going to wear? <laughs> Officer, we shall be perfectly respectable. Undress behind that rock. I'll use this one. And I promise not to look. It's all in the line of duty. Come on, last one in's a sissy. The blue pants are reassuring. <laughs> Woo! James, where are you? James, I can't see you. Oh! What? Damn you! Bye! Oh. Oh. Bastard! Sounds good. I'm praying it's not going to slip behind the cliff top before we're dry. You know there's enough water by the jetty, even at low tide, for a submarine. And get Drax to tighten the security on the cliff for the next two nights. Why are you called Gala? <laughs> My real name's even worse. Galatea. <laughs> A cruiser my father was serving in when I was born. What? What was that? Look out! Oh! Too late! Oh! 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 <laughs> Gala! Gala! Can you move? Wait! Oh, God! Okay. I can see the sun. You okay? Better. Let me help you. Sit up if you can. Get your back against the cliff. That's it. Can you open your eyes? So was there an explosion? 
In the Moonraker. No. No. We're a hundred yards from the site. <coughs> it was only above us. A great mouthful. Bitten out of the cliff. <coughs> At least we're free to the air. My God, you are... covered in blood. Huh? <laughs> You're the Red Devil. <laughs> the bloody wild orchid. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> You're a beautiful white scarecrow. <laughs> I still don't know what happened, except you saved my life. Well, someone pushed the cliff down on us. I saw the smoke and heard the bang of the explosion a split second before the cliff came down. So did the gulls. It can't have only been Krebs. It was done in full view of the site, well organized. Well spied. And now they're assuming we're properly buried. We'd better stay alive and find out what's what. But there's not enough evidence to make the Prime Minister interfere with the Moonraker. And some of those Germans up there seem to want us dead before Friday. Why? If someone is trying to sabotage the test launch, we'll get it postponed. Keep going. The tide's coming in fast, but we can get to St Margaret's before it catches us. We'll clean up at the Granville and then go back to the house. Huh. I wonder what sort of reception we'll get. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Sorry we're late. What? Jeez. I saw the Englander. My dear chap, good heavens, what a relief. We were wondering whether to send out a search party. Turn that music down, Krebs. Yeah, 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 yeah. A few minutes ago, a cliff fall was reported. You might have let me know, Miss Brand. Sorry. It was my fault, Sir Hugo. The walk was longer than I expected. I thought we might get caught by the tide, so we went on to St. Margaret's, had something to eat, and took a taxi. Miss Brand wanted to telephone, didn't you? Mm. But I thought we'd be back before eight. I see. Please, sit down. Go on with your dinner. Perhaps I might join you for coffee. I expect Miss Brand would prefer to go to her room. She must be tired after her long day. Go to bed, Miss Brand. I'll talk to you in the morning. I'm sorry. Sorry. Good night. Well, remarkable, those cliffs, walking along, wondering if they're going to, you know, collapse on you. Ha! <laughs> Russian roulette. What were you saying about a cliff fall? <laughs> oh, Mr. Krebs. Ist alles in Ordnung? <clears throat> Doctor, can't you see that Krebs is ill? Take the idiot out, put him to bed. Schnell, bitte! Oh, of course, Sir Hugo. <laughs> Marsh! A heavy day? He drinks too much. So, uh, how did the fueling go? Cigar? No? Mm. Everything is ready now. The guards are out. By the way, I shall be taking Miss Brand up to London in the Mercedes tomorrow afternoon. I shall need a secretary as well as Krebs. I have to drive to town too. My final report to the Ministry. What about? I thought you were satisfied with the arrangements. Oh, yes. Good. And now I have papers waiting for me in my study. I'll say good night. Play music if you wish. Who is it? Gala. I thought you'd gone to bed. I did. James, I'm sorry if I woke you. I just had a thought. Yes? Clearly somebody wants us out of the way. Well... Apparently. So are we suspected of being saboteurs? Maybe. Just so long as the Moonraker is out of danger. Is that your thought? No. My thought is the dinner table. Oh? It was only laid for three people. Are you ready, Miss Brand? All done? Yes, Sir Hugo. I prepared the final launching plan. Good, I have it. Collect your things. We'll leave in five minutes. Mm -hmm. All set? I think so. I saw Dr. Valter through my spy hole, entering the latest gyro figures in Drax's black book. Try and get that book. On the drive to London. It's easy for you to say. You'll find a way. <sighs> Better get going. I'll be following in half an hour. Mm -hmm. What time are you seeing Ronnie Valance? What, my real boss? At six. 
I'm meeting him at five. So listen, dinner at Mirabel at 7.30, then back here in my car, okay? James? Yes? Thank you. For what? I, I don't know. I've been playing the secretary too long. And now? Time to take risks. It was a hot, sunny day, and Drax was at the wheel of his open-top Mercedes in his shirt sleeves. Gala sat beside him, Krebs in the narrow back seat behind the driver. She glanced at the top of the little notebook protruding from Drax's hip pocket, then laid her folded coat over the space between them and drew an inch or two nearer to Drax, her hand beneath the folds of the coat. She settled herself to wait. A chance came. For God's sake, move! Come on, lights are green, move it! These suburban drivers, idiot on parade! Whoops! Sorry, Sir Hugo. His apologies, my dear, but indicate, you dolt! We're not psychic! Get off the road! Don't blood hammer! <clears throat> Excuse me, Sir Hugo. Yes, what is it? I'm terribly sorry, Sir Hugo, but could we possibly stop just for a moment? I, I want... I, I mean, I'm really sorry, but I... Um, I need to powder my nose. It's terribly stupid of Powder me. your nose? Yes. Oh, I see. Christ, why the hell didn't I'm you... I'm so sorry. Yes, well, all right. Look out for somewhere. Well, there's a hotel just around this bed. Thank you so much, Sir Hugo. It was stupid of me. Yes, just as I recorded them from the Air Ministry figures and the estimated settings for the gyro compasses, but... No. No. These are different from mine. Quite different. Where are today's figures? This is weird. Am I wrong? By nearly 90 degrees. If I am, on my flight plan, the rocket would land somewhere in France. That can't be right. So how could I... Jesus. Every day I'm 90 degrees out, launching Moonraker at right angles to its true course. I, I couldn't have made such a mistake. Does the Ministry know these secret figures? And why should they be secret? She tore out a specimen page, rolled it into a tight ball and stuffed it into the finger of one of her gloves. Back in the car, Gala was jerked sideways as Drax skidded onto the London road. She let the coat again fall onto the seat between them. Wait, though, until he's... Now! Nine! Got you! What? Oh, let go! Let me go! Nine! <laughs> Stop the car, man, Captain. Miss Brand is a spy. What's this, does? She has our book. What? Scheiße! Hold her! We'll turn off the road. <laughs> Now, what is this? I can explain, Sir Hugo. It's a mistake. I didn't mean it. There's a human, Captain. I saw her edging up close to you. You see? Under your mantle, the notebook in her hand. So. Oh! Strike her there, Krebs. Behind the left ear. Oh! An hour later, passers-by saw a white Mercedes draw up outside a small house at the Buckingham Palace end of Ebury Street and two kind gentlemen help a sick girl out and through the front door. Eventually, one of the gentlemen emerged and drove off. Seen the evening papers, James? Hmm, just catching up with them. Heavy selling is stirring all day. Started in Tangier, then spread to Zurich and New York. Dealers have made a killing. And, uh, this wire's just come in. Hmm. Operation now confirmed. Started by Drax Metals Limited in Tangier. Incredible. Close of business, the firm had sold British currency short to the tune of 20 million. Bank of England stepping in. There's a suggestion here that the Moonraker is going to be a failure. You mean Drax knows it and wants to profit by his knowledge? More likely he's acting for some foreign government. The Argentine, Russia, someone with big sterling balances. So nothing to do with the Ministry? Or the Moonraker, which will launch punctually at noon tomorrow. I'm meeting Galabrand at six. I need to ask her if she's seen any Tangier cables. I doubt it. She'd have told me. I don't like mysteries. Am I in a hospital? No. What? 
tied to a chair? Do they intend to kill me? All this machinery, wireless or radar, and the, the book. 90 degrees difference. Suppose my figures are correct all the time for the target 80 miles away in the North Sea. Then I wouldn't have been aiming the rocket in the middle of France after all. But Drax's numbers, 90 degrees to the left of the target. So somewhere in England, 80 miles from Dover. Of course, that's it. Drax's figures would... This is a radar homing device. Ingenious. Same as on the raft in the North Sea. Bring the rocket down here a hundred yards from Buckingham Palace. Not a test at all, a real atomic warhead. Dropping fast as light out of a clear sky. Crowds in the streets, nursemaids in the park, great bloom of flame a mile wide. And then nothing. Nothing left. Hugo Drax, enemy of England. Tomorrow at noon, he's going to destroy London. Long after Drax had gone, she kept up her pretense of unconsciousness. At first, Krebs occupied himself with the machines. Then he was standing in front of her. She felt his hand touch her neck, and the automatic recoil of her body had to be covered by a pretense of consciousness returning. Uh, what? Why have I been brought here? Those... those machines? Ah, that is a lure for a little bird. <laughs> a big one. And the pretty girl is here because otherwise she might frighten the bird away. And that would be sad, wouldn't it? Filthy English bitch! Who are you working for? You have to answer me, you know. We are all alone here. There is no one to hear you scream. Bond, Ronnie Valens here. Seen anything of Miss Brand? No. I'm still waiting for her. Here at the Mirabelle. She's half an hour late. Didn't she turn up at six? She did not. Uh. Now listen, I'm at a wretched black tie dinner at the mansion house. Can you handle this for me? I can't put out a general call. We'd have the whole press round our ears. But I want her found. You can have all the help you want. Don't worry. I'll look after it. What do you know about Drax's movement? He wasn't expected at the ministry until seven. I left word... Wait a minute. Sir? What? This came in. Thanks. Report passed on by the city police. Let's see. Drax left at 20 hundred hours. Dining at Blades if wanted. Back at site 2300 hours. So well, he'll be leaving London about nine. And uh, just a moment. There's more here. Sir Hugo stated Miss Brand felt unwell on arrival in London, but at her request he left her at Victoria Station bus terminal at 1645. She stated she would rest with friends, address unknown, and contact Sir Hugo at Ministry at 1900 hours. She hasn't done so. Huh. And that's all, James. Has Drax got a place in London? He always stays at the Ritz, but he's got a house in Ivory Street. We checked there. Looked unoccupied. Just behind Buckingham Palace. Some sort of hideout probably takes his women there. Look, I ought to be getting back to the top brass will think the crown jewels have been stolen. Bond rang off. He picked up the receiver again and called Blades to check that Drax was still in the club. It was the friendly voice of Brevet. Oh, yes, Mr Bond, sir. He's in the dining room. Do you wish to speak to him? Bond didn't. He wolfed down some food and left the restaurant. He drove to St James's Street, parking under cover of the central row of taxis outside Boodle's. He settled himself behind an evening paper, over which he could keep his eyes on a section of Drax's Mercedes which he was relieved to see standing in Park Street unattended. He'd not long to wait. Suddenly a broad shaft of yellow light shone out from the doorway of Blades and the figure of Drax appeared. He walked quickly across to the white Mercedes and was away down St. James's Street. Bond, in his old Bentley, was ready for him. God, the man moves quickly. Buckingham Palace Gate. So, looks like Ebury Street. Yes, he's gonna stop at his house. Bond pulled up short of the corner. 
A minute later, he could make out Krebs helping the muffled figure of a girl across the pavement. Then the door of the Mercedes slammed and Drax was off again. Bond raced after him. <sighs> Thank God the Mercedes is white. Chelsea Bridge, South Circular. It looks like the Dover Road, so she's a prisoner. What has she discovered? Does he plan to get rid of her on the way? Stay with it. My Capitaine, only a hundred meters behind us now. Ah. It is the Bigley of Commander Bond. So that old museum piece of his can still move. <laughs> so much the better, Krebs. We'll give him a run for his money. Yeah. If he survives it, we'll get him in the bag with this woman. Turn on the radio. Home service. We'll soon find out if there's a hitch. This great weapon devised by the ingenuity of man to soar a thousand miles into the firmament <laughs> above an area patrolled by Her Majesty's ships. The Moonraker, designed exclusively for the defense of our beloved island. Our beloved island? The glorious <laughs> development of man's great journey away from the confines <laughs> of this planet. Sir Hugo Drax, that great patriot and benefactor of our country. Switch him off. Great Britain's hero. Drax took a left-hand fork and started up a long winding hill. Ahead, in the beam of his headlights, a huge diesel carrier was grinding into the first bend laboring under 14 tons of newsprint. Damn it. OK, Krebs, get out your knife. I'm going to slow down right behind this lorry. You climb out onto the bonnet, and when I come up behind, jump onto the back. Oh, Peter, my Capitaine. I shall be going at walking pace. <laughs> it will be safe. You will cut the ropes that hold the rolls of paper, the left ones first, then the right. I shall have pulled up level with the lorry, and when you have cut the second lot, jump back into the car. Be careful you are not swept off with the paper, Verschonden. <laughs> yeah. Go now. <laughs> Two minutes later, the flying figure of Krebs was landing back in the Mercedes. Ah! Uh, 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 oh my God! If that doesn't hold him, ah, nothing will. A master stroke, my captain. When they burst wunderschön, like the lavatory paper of a giant. It made a pretty parcel of him. He was just coming round the bend, and the second as good as the first. So good, son. A fine paper chase. You did well, Billy. <laughs> but we can't leave him there. We must turn round and get him. This is car. <laughs> Kaput. Turn him over. Oh, he's breathing. Search him. Bring him to the car. Oh, Peter. I'll give you a hand. Into the back seat. Oh. Tie him up. I don't want any mistakes. Oh, God. James. James, it's me, Gallop. Are you all right? Christ. A hell of a mess. Oh. It, is anything broken? No, a crack on the head, that's all. Am I talking sense now? Of course. Uh, now listen, this is what I know. Half an hour later, they were being hustled through the doors of Drax's office on the Moonraker site. Bond's mind was suddenly as sharp as a blade. A million deaths on my hands? Something, anything must be done. You won't use that Luger dress. Oh, he will. He was best shot in the Brandenburg division. Tie her to a chair, Krebs. Then the man. Yes, he You'd be afraid of touching off the fuel. Your memory is bad, Englishman. I told you this room is cut off from the shaft by the double doors. Another step and you will have no stomach. When they were both tied securely to the arms and legs of two steel chairs, Krebs picked up a mechanic's blowtorch. Now, the good Krebs is an artist with one of these things. We used to call him, what was it, Vili? Dysfangsman. The persuader. You'll be lucky. You, Brand. Who are you working for? The girl, any way you like, Krebs. Okay. Stop. She works for Scotland Yard. So do I. That's better. Does anybody know you are prisoners? Did you telephone anyone? If we had, they'd be here by now. True. Krebs, put the blowtorch down. Oh. You may go. Tell the others what is necessary. Verstanden? 
Yes, my Kapitän. <coughs> I leave the torch in case you need it. Ask though you too. You don't know how I've longed for an English audience to tell my story. As a matter of fact, a full account is now in the hands of a very respectable firm of Edinburgh solicitors. Edinburgh? Yes, out of danger. <laughs> They have instructions to open the envelope on completion of the first successful flight of the Moonraker. But you shall have a preview tomorrow, moments before you are burnt alive. Get on with it, Kraut. Yes, I am indeed a Reichsdeutscher. And even England will soon agree they have been licked by just one single German. <laughs> by order! You don't mind if I smoke a cigar? I would offer you one, Bond, but uh, your hands are tied. Huh. Listen. My real name is Graf Ugo von der Drache. My mother was English. I was educated here until I could stand this filthy country no longer. I completed my education in Berlin. I joined the party. Eventually the war came. I was transferred to the Foreign Intelligence Service of the SS. Terrorism and sabotage. Intoxicating. I was able to bring many an Englishman to book. But then... Hitler was betrayed again by his swinish generals. The English and Americans were allowed to land in France. Too bad. Too bad. But for me, it was the high spot of the whole war. I went right through the American lines with the famous 150 Panzer Brigade and the Ardennes Breakthrough in 44. My English was needed. We were all in English uniforms. When we had to withdraw, I stayed where I was, went to ground behind the Allied lines. We stayed in those woods for six months, reported back to the fatherland by radio. Then, one day, one of our own planes coming back from a reconnaissance saw me and came after me with his cannon blasted me right off the road. How long I lay there, I don't know. Seems I was picked up by a British scout car, taken to a British field hospital. When I came round, they had no idea who I was, just a fellow Englishman, nearly dead. During the year I was pushed from one hospital to the next, I made my plans. You know what they were? Revenge on your rescuers. Revenge on England. What they had done to me and my country. It became an obsession. I admit it. I despise you all! Hiding behind your bloody white cliffs while other people fight your battles! But yes, the good doctors were so anxious to help me find out who I really was. <laughs> From the identities they offered me, I came upon the name of Hugo Drax. From Drache to Drax. Oh, thank you, doctors. I think it might be me. Yes, they said, of course it's you. I walked out of the hospital looking for someone to kill and rob. No sweat. £15,000. Then to Tangier, where you could buy anything. Columbite, rarer than platinum, and everyone would want it. The jet age. I took risks. And suddenly, the first million was there. Then the second. The twentieth. I came back. London was in my pocket. Then Germany. I found Krebs. Found my brilliant technicians. They waited. And where was I? In Moscow. They listened to me and started to build the atomic warhead. Back to London, the coronation, my letter to the palace, hooray for Drax! <laughs> my men come over and we start. Under the very skirts of Britannia, on top of her famous cliffs, we build a jetty into your English Channel for supplies. The Russians came in dead on time last Monday, but then Talon has to hear something. He talks to the Ministry, but Krebs is listening. Lots are drawn. Barch dies a hero's death. The new warhead is hoisted into place, perfectly. The old one is now behind the Iron Curtain, and the submarine is on her way back here. We'll soon be creeping under the waters of the English Channel to take us all off at one minute past midday tomorrow. <laughs> Say something. Don't you think my story is remarkable? For one man to have done all that? Well... Galloping paranoia, I imagine, with a little megalomania on the side. Same as people who think they're God. As it is, you're just a mad dog that will have to be shot. You, you useless, decadent fool! OK, Miss Brand, I don't think you two will give me any more trouble. Krebs never makes a mistake with his knots. When Commander Bond wakes up, you can tell him these doors will open once more, just before noon tomorrow. A few minutes later, there will be nothing left of either of you. Not even the stoppings in your teeth. <laughs> what? <laughs> Had to get him mad. Didn't want to give him time to think. Don't worry. London's OK. Got a plan. 
his lighter. Uh, it, it's on the desk. Right. Here we go. Rock and roll. Follow me. <coughs> they edged their chairs forward. Bond nudged the lighter into his tied hands. Got it. Seconds later, the blowtorch was burning away the flex binding Gala's wrist to the metal chair. Ah, oh, that's it. My arm's free. Let me turn it off. Now. There. I can untie you. You're free. Huh. What? That's for what you did. Thanks. You're a wonderful girl. Okay. Listen, Gala. In ten minutes, James, I'm going to have to... James, don't go on. I'm sorry, but... I know you're going to say something dreadful. Please stop, James. Come on, Gala. It's a bloody miracle we've got the chance. Listen, I shall walk out of here and shut the doors and light a last cigarette under the tail of the Moonraker. God, what are you saying? You're as mad as Drax. <laughs> What the hell? It's me or a million people in London. The warhead won't go off. Atom bombs don't explode like that. And there's just a chance you may get away. The boy stood on the burning deck. I wanted to copy him since I was five. I don't care what you say. We've got to think of something else. Look, it's past midnight. God knows what time he'll be coming back to set the gyros. Wait! The gyros? To set the gyros? That's it? Don't you see? After he's gone, we alter the gyros back. Back to the old flight plan. Then the rocket will simply fall into the North Sea where it's supposed to go. Can't we? Do you know the other settings? Of course I do. I've been living with them for a year. By God, we might do it. <laughs> if only we can hide somewhere. And make Drax think we've escaped. Hmm. Where? One of the ventilator shafts. There are only 50 of them. Come on. The big round mouths of the shafts were spaced about ten yards apart and about four feet off the floor. Bond carefully opened the hinge that covered one of them and looked up. Forty feet away, there was a faint glimmer from the moonlight outside. It was going to be a painful business, but there was no doubt they could inch their way up one of these shafts and in the turn at the top lie hidden. An hour later, their feet and shoulders bruised and cut they lay exhausted, squeezed tight in each other's arms, their heads inches away from the circular grating directly above the outside door. Seven a.m. Sun's coming up. There's Drax with Dr. Valta and Krebs. They're walking like executioners. Huh. The Inglander escaped. They may be up there in one of the ventilator shafts. All right, we'll take a chance. Dr. Walter will put the steam hose up each shaft to tell the others to listen for their screams. Verstanden? To be fear. <laughs> Can it reach 40 feet? 50 shafts. Where will they begin? This will hurt, by the way. Oh, thanks. You'll just have to take it. Hmm. Here it comes. It may burn. It won't kill us. Be brave. Shut up. Two away. Next door. Hold tight. Now teach me the gyro figures. Then we're all agreed, Minister. Yes, Sir Hugo, those are the gyro settings. My people have checked them independently with the Air Ministry this morning. Then if you'll allow me the privilege, I'll walk over to the launching dome. Oh. Oh, yes, of course, gentlemen. Oh, yes, straight away. Hold it up, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, gentlemen. 11.45. Gala, you all right? Fine. Let's go. They slithered their way down the 40 feet of shaft. Gala made her way to Drax's office. Bond sweated up the iron stairway. Difficult to see where Moonraker's tapering nose ended and the sky began. Finally, the door of the gyro chamber. He crawled inside. (laughs) 
Now, turn, twist, steady. That's for the roll. Now the pitch and yaw. Ever so gently. And steady. Four minutes to go. <laughs> Crazy. Back out. And go. James. You made, you made it. it. Huh. All done. Fingers crossed. Does he have a wireless in here? Yes. Sir Hugo has been persuaded to say a few words into the microphone. It certainly is a wonderful day here. <laughs> Those crowds in the distance by the Coast Guard station will be getting quite oh, a suntan. <laughs> Hello, what's going on? By Jove, there's a submarine just surfaced alongside. One of our biggest, I should say. And Sir Hugo's team is down there too, lined up on the jetty. <laughs> Looks like they're preparing to file on board. It must be an idea of the Admiralty's. Give them a special grandstand out there in the channel. Now Sir Hugo is coming towards us. Everyone here at the firing point is giving him a cheer. And I can see the sun glinting on the nose of the Moonraker way over there behind him, just showing out of the top of the launching dome. He's coming into the firing point, and here he is. Sir Hugo Drax. Uh. Your Majesty, men and women of England, I am about to change the course of England's <laughs> history. In a few minutes' time, the lives of all of you will be altered, in some cases drastically, by the... Impact of Moon. I don't believe it. I am very proud and pleased that fate has singled me out to fire this great arrow of vengeance into the skies and thus to proclaim for all time the might of my fatherland. Oh, God. I hope this occasion will be forever a warning that the fate of my country's enemies will be written in dust, in ashes, in tears, and in blood. And now, thank you all for listening. He's mad. Quite mad. Thank you, Sir Hugo. Marvellous. <laughs> and that was Sir Hugo Drax saying a few words to you before he walks across to the switch on the wall, which will fire the Moonraker. Well, he certainly doesn't mince his words. And now it's time for me to hand over to the Ministry of Supplies expert, Miriam Train. Many of you will remember her as Nobel Prize runner-up for physics last year. She will describe to you the actual firing of the Moonraker. Over to you, Professor Train. Only a minute more. Of course. Jolly hockey sticks. Yes, thanks so much. Hello there. And now Sir Hugo has his hand on the button. Oh, Jesus. Ten. He certainly got his eye on the chronometer. Oh, God. Nine. And the radar operators are watching like hawks. Eight. Oh, and all of them are wearing earplugs. Seven. First, the radio beam will set the pinwheel going. Six. The valves will open liquid fuel, secret formula. Five. That will be ignited when it gets to the I rocket boat. Four. Meanwhile, the turbine pumps begin to turn. Three. Pumping the flaming fuel into the exhaust pit. Two. Rule Britannia. One. Oh, my God. Fire. Chin, chin. Cheers. Yes. Thank you, Professor Train. And Sir Hugo has now left the firing point. They're walking over to the edge of the cliff. He stepped on the hoist. He's going down. Oh, he must be going out to the submarine. A few more seconds. He's looking back, raising his arm in the air. Good old Sir Hugo. Christ. Well, what happened? London? North Sea? Travelling perfectly right in the centre of the radar screen. A perfect launching. Afraid you couldn't hear anything because of the noise. Terrific. First of all, the great sheet of flame coming out of the cliff. Then you should have seen the nose slowly creep up out of the dome. And there she was, like a great silver pencil, standing upright on this, this huge column of flame and slowly climbing into the air. The howl of the thing nearly burst our microphones. And then she was climbing faster and faster. A hundred miles an hour, a thousand and... Ten. What's that? Ten thousand. Really? Now I'm told she's travelling at over ten thousand miles an hour. She's three hundred miles up. Can't hear her anymore, of course. Sir Hugo must be a proud man. He's out there in the channel now. The, the submarine went off like a rocket. Ha! <laughs> Must be doing more than 30 knots. Off the East Goodwins now, travelling north. She'll soon be up with the patrol ships. They'll have a view of the landing. It's quite a surprise trip there. Even the naval authorities seem a bit mystified. <laughs> but now I'll hand you over to Peter Trimble on board HMS Maganza, somewhere off the East Coast, who will describe the scene in the target area. Peter? Now for the verdict. Thanks, and this is Peter Trimble speaking, just north of the Goodwin Sands. 
calm as a mill pond. Nothing on the radar screens yet, but we shall only catch the rocket for a split second. Isn't that right, Captain? It is. Ah, the target's just showing on the screen. It must be 70 miles north of here. Yes, Captain? Oh, yes, I, I see. Well, a big submarine coming up fast. Only about a mile away. Suppose it's the one they say Sir Hugo's aboard with his men. None of us here were told anything about her. Captain Edwards said she's not flying colours. <laughs> Very mysterious. I've got her now, quite clear in my glasses. We've changed course to intercept her. The captain says she isn't one of ours. Hello. She's broken out of colours. She's Russian, I think. Good heavens. Captain says she's a Russian. I say. And now she's submerging. Did you hear that? We fired a shot across her bows, but she's disappeared. Sir, what? Faster underwater. Uh, the Aztec operator says she's going even faster underwater. 25 knots. 25 knots. Well, she can't see much underwater, but she's right in the target area now. 12 minutes past noon. Moonraker must have turned and be on her way down. She'll be here any second. Hope there's not going to be a tragedy. The Russian's well inside the danger zone. Our radar operator's holding up his hand. That means she's due. She's coming. She's coming. God! Look out! Terrific explosion! Black cloud going up into the air! There's a tidal wave coming at us! Great wall of water tearing down! There goes the submarine! God! Thrown out of the water! Upside down! Oh my god! Oh god! Two hundred dead so far, about the same number missing. Reports still coming in. Most of our losses were among the patrol craft, including the Maganza and that BBC chap. Any news of the submarine, sir? Lying on her side in about thirty fathoms. I hear Valance got hold of those Edinburgh solicitors before they opened Drax's message to the world. Yes. Reads as if it's been written by Jehovah. What happens now? Well, they're going to try the biggest cover-up job in history. A load of scientific twaddle. Unexpectedly powerful explosion on impact, tragic loss of Sir Hugo and his team, and one of HM submarines. Unaccountable error in mistaking White Ensign for Soviet naval colours. What about the atomic explosion? The famous mushroom cloud? Hmm. Tricky one, that. Going to be passed off as normal formation after an explosion of that size. What's well, got to come down somewhere, of course. Uh, yes, Prime Minister? Ah, uh, yes, Miles. Her Majesty commands the two of them tomorrow at 11. Well-deserved honour. Winston, um, my man would have been very proud, but of course it's a, it's a rule here Break in... it. Unwise, I think. Oh, stubborn as a camel always were. Very well, but get them out of England by tomorrow afternoon. Of course, Valence doesn't have the same problem with Miss Brand. It would be the least she deserves. <laughs> Brand not bond. Shall be done. Sir? PM wants you both out of the country by tomorrow afternoon. Stay away for a month. You'd both be gone sooner, only the girl's got an appointment tomorrow morning. Oh? The palace. Immediate award of the George Cross. What's her name? Gala? <laughs> for gallantry? Oh, and by the way, your new Bentley's downstairs. Miss Moneypenny has inspected it. Says it looks lovely. James. Gala. I wish you were going to be there tomorrow, James. Tomorrow morning or tomorrow night? I meant at the palace. What are you going to do afterwards? Over there. What? The young man with his back to us. Uh, yes? I'm going to marry him. Tomorrow afternoon. His name's Detective Inspector Vivian. Huh. I see. Sorry. I'm jealous. I had other plans for you tomorrow night. And what were they? Farmhouse in France. Wonderful dinner and... Uh... <laughs> I'm very sorry. Yes. Well, goodbye, Gala. Goodbye, James. Bond touched her hand for the last time. Then they turned away from each other and walked off into their different lives.
in Moonraker by Ian Fleming. James Bond was played by Toby Stevens. Galabrand by Catherine Kingsley. And Sir Hugo Drax by Samuel West. M, John Standing. Q, Julian Sands. Miss Moneypenny, Janie D. Ronnie Valance, Jared Harris. And Lord Basildon and Krebs were played by Nigel Anthony. Professor Train, Patricia Hodge. BBC commentator, Ian Ogilvy. Max Meyer, Dr. Walter, and commentator Trimble, Simon De Denny. Movie tone voice and minister, John Glover. Brevet, Matthew Wolfe. Other parts were played by Kenneth Danziger, Darren Richardson, and Matthew Wolfe. John Baddeley played Sir Winston Churchill, and Martin Jarvis was the voice of Ian Fleming. Specially composed music, Mark Holden and Michael Lopez. Moonraker was dramatized by Archie Scottney, directed by Martin Jarvis, and is a Jarvis and Ayres production.